This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Today, we have prepared a special episode just for you. It's a one-off mashup episode as a part of the recent nominations for the Australian Podcast Awards. I guess you could call this episode Purpose Decoded. Firstly, a huge congratulations goes out to all of the nominees who were announced last weekend. Um, The awards event, virtual event, is on the 21st of November, so we can't wait to find out who the winners were. Uh, I think this is such an exciting time for the podcasting industry, especially in 2020, because despite the COVID chaos, uh, I think we can really celebrate podcasts as being such a great way and an easy way to inspire, educate and to engage humanity in conversations of all types that really do change the world. As we say at Future Crunch, if we want to change the story of the human race in the 21st century, we have to change the stories we tell ourselves. And it's through meaningful conversations that we can create cognitive dissonance and flip the narratives that really do need to change in order to create a more purpose-driven and peaceful world. Now, on this occasion, uh, Decoding Purpose didn't make it through to the nomination stage, but we still absolutely won because we created some great content focusing on three key areas, which I am beyond excited to share with you today. And those categories include well-being, uh, purpose as a tool for well-being, purpose in business, and then a feature on Decoding Purpose as a new and exciting thought leadership podcast. Uh, in in the last category, we we featured uh, grabs from some of the more memorable moments and I guess the moments that really created uh, that aha moment and gave us deeper insights into what purpose is. Um, Some of the incredible guests in the wellbeing category include Sarah Rowan, who is Australia's leading performance and speed painter, Kayla Colbum, who is the founder of Boma Global and the CEO of Boma New Zealand, Richie Harkham, who is the creator of A Return on Resilience, Sarah Nally, the co-founder of Wanda and Wanda, and our business thought leaders include Amanda Duff, uh, who is from Employment Innovations, David Burkus, who is the global thought leader and author on purpose, Krista Solkus, the author of The Gift of Crisis, Jason Harris, all the way from New York. He is the founder of Mechanism and author of The Soulful Art of Persuasion and our very own Lisa Messenger, who is the founder of Collective Hub uh, and also a serial author and all-round game changer. Finally, in the new podcast uh, award entry, we have Greg Page, who is the original Yellow Wiggle. That was an incredible interview. Zach Mercurio, who is literally the global purpose sensei. Um, I mean that in every sense of the word. He's also an author and speaker. Julie Masters, who is the host of the Inside Influence podcast and CEO of Influence Nation. Jamie Skeller, who is an incredible technologist and futurist, and again, Kayla Colburn. So kick back and get ready for for some epic shots of wonder, wisdom and wealth found only in the decoding of, you guessed it, purpose. While I am here, if you love this podcast and you want to let us know, you can do one of two things. Please take a minute to leave us a review Or if you feel so inclined, you can jump on the Australian Podcast website and vote for us as a part of the Listener's Choice Award. The web link is www.australianpodcastawards.com forward slash vote. So for now, welcome to the podcast. First up, we will have the wellbeing nomination. I believe that the 36 years where I was in the church, it was a very high and low filled time. 
Mm. I was raised to believe that I could not be gay and and serve God. I couldn't. They're they're not. What was the word? Mutually exclusive. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And it was very black and white. And by the age of 19, when I realized I was gay, I, it was like the most horrific moment of my life. And Mm. I immediately started begging God to kill me or to change the rules because I didn't know how to live in my skin. And I began to suffocate who I was and suppress it. And I just was consumed with so much shame that I convinced myself I could live what I was taught was the right way. And so I married into a heterosexual relationship and from the very beginning knew that in my core, it wasn't who I was, Mm. but I had been so brainwashed to think that this was the only option to live by that I chose that day after day, year after year. And within 12 years, I was riddled with sickness and mental illness Mm. because our emotions are so linked to our bodies Absolutely. And it's it was remarkable that there's this very much of a turning point two years ago, almost when I, um, for the first time, I realized I could love myself and be myself because I, I never left the marriage because I thought if I leave, I will still end up killing myself out of shame mm. that I won't be there for my kids because... I'm either here with my kids and miserable, or even if I leave, I'll be miserable and still feel shame because I left them. Mm. And my kids are proud of me. We have a great relationship. Oh, that's so it's beautiful. so stunning. And and it was And so true to their world. Yeah. I mean, we are living in a much more open and right. inclusive world. And, right. and as much as there's things that still need healing, mm-hmm. a lot of incredible things have also happened. Right. Um, you know, and I so I think you've given them a gift. Mm-hmm. So I'm really interested to talk about how we change state because, you know, (laughs) to use a metaphor, when I think of courage, I I think of the Wizard of Oz and and the courageous lion who's actually terrified inside. And so if we are like the lion in in that moment, uh, say when, when we're trying to actively hear someone, as an example, and we feel all of that fear come up, we feel that vulnerability come up with its emotional exposure and, and all the shame that goes with that. Firstly, if we have the awareness to notice all of that, from there, how do we shift state? What are the steps to to really be able to transform that fear into courageous action? Yeah, well, the awareness is the first step. The awareness in and of itself mm. drives transformation. So if I am... <clears throat> if I am feeling shame about something and I've let the shame take over and I've let my anger take over and, uh, you know, we, you and I go into a conversation together and um, my engagement with you is driven by that shame and by that anger, it's going to go terribly. It'll go terribly for both of us, right? Like mm. you're not going to, you're going to feel terrible and I'm not going to get the outcome that I want. If I can sit with the awareness, the presence to be able to go, oh, what I'm feeling right now looks like anger. When I dig into it further, there are elements there of resentment. And when I dig into it further, because what's driving the resentment is an element of powerlessness. And the way that I got to powerlessness is by not being willing or able to set and maintain my own boundaries which drove me to feel powerless because then you had control over me, which drove me to feel resentment because then you had control over me, which is now being expressed as anger. And at the heart of all that, working back through the anger, through the resentment, through the powerlessness, at the base of it is shame, which is this feeling that uh, I'm shame. The definition of shame is the deeply painful feeling that we are somehow flawed and not worthy of love, belonging, or connection. Mm. And often that is what stands in the way of us being able to set and maintain healthy boundaries, for example. Because what if I set a boundary and I say, I'm not willing to do this? And you say, okay, then leave. Mm. And does that mean then that I'm that I've that I'm not good enough? I've been kicked out of the tribe. And these are like, these are things that are evolutionary in terms of their nature, their their seriousness, their importance, because you know, we evolved to be tribal creatures. And any sense, if I'm going to get kicked out of the tribe, that is life or death for me. 
Mm. right? If I get kicked out of the community. And so any sense that I might not be worthy of love, belonging, or connection, that's not just like a touchy feely, nice to have thing. This is like, I will be kicked out of the tribe and I will die. Yeah. I will be eaten by saber tooth tigers. That is not okay. And so it, you know, it's one of the most primitive emotions we have that, you know, we all have it unless we're uh, psychopaths or sociopaths. And so being aware of that and going, oh, what's at the heart of that is this deep fear that I'm not good enough. That simple awareness is transformative in and of itself. Now, over the time that I've known you, you've on different occasions shown me footage of your darkest days in hospital. And you have said there were days when you really wanted to give up, which was understandable at that time in terms of what you were facing, including potentially losing your leg. Uh, what was the role of purpose in getting you through those dark days? Um, it's an interesting question. You know, without, without having your purpose to get to do something, then why would you fight on for something? Mm. Why would you want to beat anything? If you don't have a purpose for your life, then what's the point? But for me, having a purpose to succeed, to get ahead, to keep my leg, to achieve the things that I want to do in my life, it gave me just that little bit of a push. But when you're in it and when you're really down on those days, it's, it's very, very, very hard sometimes to remember your purpose. And the greatest things about moments like that is it, re it defines your purpose. It gives you a new purpose even in your life, mm. you know. And I know from talking to you, you focus a lot on the power of optimism and mindset. In those times where you were in the dark, where it was really difficult, how did you flip your mindset? How did you, despite searing pain, the possibility of losing your leg, of really being quite unsure how you were going to heal and recover, how did you in those times choose optimism and, and flip your mindset out of the, the doom and gloom of the situation to still be able to have a sense of hope that you could move forward? So two, two things. One is I would give myself a purpose. So, for instance, Hark Angel came out in those times. Becoming a speaker came out in those times of my doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a purpose to fight on. Yeah. So that's one way. And then the second way is... I would, I would just take it day by day. I wouldn't try to think so far ahead. I think a lot of us in our lives, we, we think about tomorrow and the next day and one month and one year rather than just be right there right now. It's bad, okay, but you can get through it. You just have to do your best minute by minute. Mm. You know, Don't try to do it for next month or next year. Because if I try to think about the situation that I was in, then I would have been doomed. Because I was only 23 years of age uh, when I basically went through a, a massive mental breakdown and the reason I had that breakdown was as a result of experiencing a repressed memory recall of sexual abuse that had happened in uh, my childhood whilst I was in primary school. Um, I, up until that point in time, had had no memory I'd completely repress the memory, which is something uh, in a conversation about resilience, children have incredibly resilient brains, so much so that by default they will often completely repress trauma uh, mm. because they just don't have the ability to be able to emotionally process that level of trauma as a child. And so that is what happened to me. Um, that emotional breakdown led me uh, to go into quite severe depression and anxiety and uh, spent on, on two separate occasions, um, two six-week lots in, in hospital being treated for depression and anxiety. Uh, for the following 12 years, I worked very, very closely with a psychiatrist. I also spent uh, an enormous amount of time exploring different Eastern healing modalities and uh, within that, yes, you know, it was it was definitely a courageous journey of, of rediscovering the self and of really doing the work required to heal, to be able to become the person I am today. And whilst I would never want uh, anyone to have to go through what I went through, what I will say is, is all of those experiences have absolutely moulded my purpose 
and who I am today because going through that experience uh, enabled me to make a very conscious decision about why I wanted to choose life. And I think when you go to the edge of darkness or the edge of a crisis or the edge of that degree of pain, whatever it is, and for everybody that's different. For me, I have my story, but you have your story of of crisis and resilience. Everyone has a different thread, a different narrative. Um, But, you know, at some level when that happens, when we're on that edge, we have to choose life. And if we're going to choose life, we often need to make that life meaningful for it to really count, for it to really connect. And for me, that that is what happened. And I knew I had a lot of work to heal ahead of me and, and hence why I, I did all the work with psychiatrists and the healing work. Like it's not an easy journey, but it is the most fulfilling journey when you not only make a conscious choice to choose life, but to create a legacy with that life and that that gives you the inspiration to do the work. And were there any significant turning points that come to mind for you? Yes. Yeah, several. Yeah. Um, like many people, when you have a health scare, for example, that can be a point that creates that contrast in your life. Mm. Um, there's nothing sort of sharper in terms of contrast between like health and illness. You know, when you, um, so I had a mini stroke, a transient ischemic attack many, many years ago and losing consciousness for me um, made me appreciate consciousness. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, those Because you were only 29 pieces. when that yes. happened, right? Yeah. So Because very... that's really scary. Like just at that age, mm. I mean, you're 29, you would think that you're kind of bulletproof. You're out I there did. doing I things I was in, in the world. Indestruct- indestructible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really did. And I didn't know I was stressed. I didn't know. And I, th- and I think that's why these turning points do create that contrast that helps us understand or crystallise purpose because we can just be operating in a beta state. You know, we're just running along in autopilot and actually things kind of, they feel okay because we're not self-locating. We're not actually checking in with ourselves. And so whether it's an accident, a bump on the road, a relationship breakdown, Mm. you know, a sickness of some description, something that that genuinely clicks you into a a state of awareness where you realise there is change. Yeah. (laughs) You can't ignore that there is change. Mm helps you sometimes realise that maybe you weren't operating in a state that was beneficial to your purpose. Um, Sometimes people have that very clear, hang on, I'm not on path, I'm not on purpose, and they have that awareness or the self-location of, I have a purpose. Yeah, (laughs) and and I'm going to choose this path. And I'm going to choose now this path to align me And make an intentional decision to change. Yes, to actually move towards that purpose. Mm. So. I love, I love the theme. I think that that is so beautiful because I think that um, change is inevitable and it's always happening, but we're not always aware of it. Yeah. And actually that whole concept of self-location for me is a daily practice now because then I can pinpoint small changes mm. that maybe in the past would have taken me two or three years to become aware of. And I'm experiencing things in a much deeper way. Next up, we will have the business entry. I've sort of broken it down into a few areas and and I guess looking forward, I think what your company does for you as an employee is going to change. You know, I think there is going to be an increased focus on culture, on mental health, on the support services we can provide our employees because we're going to have to put all of this in place now while we're all working from home. Um, And I really don't see those support infrastructures being switched off at the point where we come back and work collaboratively in an office environment or in a work environment in any sense. So I think what your company does for you, there'll be some really positives that will stay changed um, in that environment. I think how we work with others is going to, has changed already and is going to stay changed. I don't think it's going to go back to normal. And what I, and there's some really great positives in this. I think the working life balance. I mean, the challenges that so many people have had of having, you know, multiple people working from home with children running around, um, daycares shut, those sorts of things. We are going to understand the challenges of work life a hell of a lot better than we ever have before um, across the board. You know, some organisations were fantastic at it already, but I think this has forced those that weren't to be uh, more you know, embracing of the fact that this work life, and we've called it a balance, but it's all kind of one at the moment. Um, 
I think, you know, diversity, this is a really big thing. If we can operate virtually, well, you know, that has just given rise to a global employment, you know, uh, market. So Mm. suddenly uh, we can look for talent anywhere and anywhere. And that goes two sides of the coin. That goes from uh, employees looking for work as well as uh, employers or businesses looking for talent. Suddenly, that's a game changer. Landscape, yeah, that's massive. Yeah. Exploded has just exploded, and that's a massive positive. If we're all geared up to work remotely, uh, deliver remotely, but also engage workforce forces remotely, we have just you know um, exponentially expanded the the labour market around the planet. Well, I think this is actually a big misconception about leadership as a whole. We always talk about having a vision or purpose and then casting that vision and then getting quote unquote buy-in from your people. Well, if you have to sell them on your vision, you you started uh, like two steps behind. You should have started figuring out what vision would resonate them. When we look at great leaders throughout the world, they usually don't cast a vision and sell it to other people. What they do is put to words the vision that was already on the hearts and minds of the people they're seeking to lead, right? So I think it starts there. I encourage a lot of managers to just start by asking their people two questions. What do we do here and how does what you do help us do that? So if you're thinking about your day-to-day job, you can ask yourself those same two questions. What The organization that you're a part of, what do they do? Right, And then pay attention to your answer. Are you talking about how that organization affects the industry a lot? That might be indicative of one archetype. Are you talking about how it serves customers? That's indicative of another. Are you, are you talking about how it's the, the underrated player and it's trying to change? That might be another one. That might be my Philly one, the underdog, right? And then the second, I think the bigger question is how does what you do help us do that? Which is literally a question about task significance. It's a question about do you get to see on a day-to-day basis how the work that you're doing contributes to that larger whole? Because that's where it's in corporate America, corporate glo- corporate Australia. I, do you guys use the term corporate Australia? I probably should have asked. <laughs> we do, we um, do. No, you're, you're in, fine. <laughs> in, that, in that corporate world, that to me is the bigger disconnect is showing people how the work that they do aligns with purpose. And then since they don't see it, that feeling of purpose falls apart. So that second question, asking that of yourself first. And then usually what I find is you think about it for a while. You think about it for three or four minutes and the answer comes to you. Now you ask yourself, great, how can I remind myself so I can answer that question faster? How can I make sure that I, it might be that I need to interact with customers more. It might be that I need to be reminded or consuming stories about the industry so that I can see the injustice in the industry that I'm fighting against. Whatever the, whatever the answer is for you, you want to be able to remind, you want to be able to have an, an instinctual answer to that question. How does what I do help us do that? And if you have to think about it for longer than two minutes or so, you don't yet. So you've got to be finding ways that you can remind yourself of that purpose because I truly do believe that's the bigger disconnect. I think there's a lot of organizations that have a a good mission, a good vision, but the disconnect is in showing your people how their day-to-day work helps them do that. Today, we are here to decode purpose and crisis. And, you know, we were just uh, having a chat before about the organisations who disrupt. And I think it's fair to say that for any organisation who is innovating at that level, they need to get really comfortable with the unknown. You know, they need to be okay about about taking risks. Um, So, you know, this idea also got me thinking about how a crisis in some ways creates the same conditions in that in a crisis we're also being asked to respond to uncertainty. In both scenarios, purpose is what becomes the anchor. So with that in mind, in your opinion, why does innovation happen in the intersection between purpose and uncertainty? I think that's that's a great, that's a fantastic idea, and it's absolutely true. Innovation is in the at the intersection of these two things: yeah. purpose and, and uncertainty. You know, sometimes that uncertainty is fast moving and destructive. Can be it's it's like a crisis, but sometimes also it can it can be you know less obvious. You know, when when for example. Uh, an evolving market uh, or uh, comes and uh, when uh, a technology becomes obsolete think about the kodak moment right mm. so purpose in that in that case gives you the directional sense of how to navigate that uncertainty right what do we need to do here and why right what what will will it mean to us and to others that's why crisis is a gift. In, in, it, it forces the work. It, it speeds it speeds up things, you know. 
uh, the, the much harder thing is to, to, to evolve uh, and innovate when, when things are still good, mm. right? So uh, how, how do you get people's attention? How do you galvanize or, my, uh, or, yeah. or manufacture Which the agency? Which kind of brings me, that's, so, that was kind of my next question, is, is can you take what you know about a crisis, those conditions, and almost recreate it as a tool to disrupt when we're in business as usual? Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, because uh, what, what you what you need to to do is to 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 create compassion. You know, mm. compassion is at the heart of shared purpose. You know, it's really about connecting and helping each other survive and thrive, uh, and uh, you know, have this meaningful and engaging uh, environment and self development uh, uh, and support. Um, I, I think the ultimate purpose is around personal and collective growth, mm -hmm. you know, and connection along the journey, which is changing. Um, think how people get so attached to each other uh, through work and shared experiences. You know, the best teams bring that to surface openly. Mm -hmm. Of course, it takes vulnerability and courage because it's always scary and uh, it's, it's easier to, to hide uh, your needs and your feelings. So I think compassion is key into this uh, equation. I wanted to ask you, do you think that entrepreneurs, leaders and influencers should really be taking this long game approach in navigating this current crisis? Yeah, definitely. I think this, what we're living in now is all about playing the long game. It's about, you know, what, we, you know, we recently wrote a, a white paper on how to sort of, it, it's it's targeting brands, but it can be targeting entrepreneurs as well. And it's basically a, sort of a playbook of how to go through um, the 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 time that we're living in and the the principles that will make you successful um, right now. And, and and really, what we're living through is a perfect time to play the long game. Mm. And you know, certainly there's there's businesses that are um, they might not have that um, ability right because they're either on the on the fringe of of you know falling apart or they might be um, go, you know going out of business or so close to to going out of business that that they don't really have that luxury but I think for for the most most part we have um, a, a way for us to really um, be successful and and play the long game and and you know some of those things are um, you know if you're fortunate enough like one example is if you're fortunate enough now to do something that helps you should be doing some something that helps you should mm. be taking an action that can you know help people it could be you know sharing vital information it could be engaging in an act of generosity like donating something to those in need um, that's one action you can be taking. You know, you can always be thinking of the way you're communicating to your audience and putting it in providing contextual value, putting it in the, the time and, and, and message of what we're dealing with mm. now. Um, you can be, you know, really rethinking your purpose. If you're an entrepreneur, why does your brand exist in the world? What is the purpose of it? It's time to rethink that. Um, it's not trying to just um, go after sales and try to make sales calls during this time mm. to get as much money or to jump on uh, the problems that people might be have or the stress that people have or the anxiety. It's really about building a brand in the long game. And there was a recent study that said that companies that uh, did this most recently in the 2008-2009 recession were way far ahead when they, when the the economy came back and we were out of that recession because they built trust with their audience they built trust with um their with a consumer during this time and you know it's not a time to curl up in a ball and be silent and it's also not a time to take advantage mm. it's a real time to go back to the basics of why your company or your brand exists in the world and what can your brand or, or company do 
um, that can be um, helpful. What can you be doing? What actions can you take that can be useful during this time? I, I think the beautiful thing about what you just said kind of taps into one of maybe the myths about purpose, that it's it's all about giving or it's all about charity or, or it's all external where mm. it's actually something that is this transformative force that kind of comes from the inside out. So yeah. whilst your purpose is giving and it is being selfless, quote unquote, in some ways, it, it's the process of feeling it within and experiencing that transformative force that enables you to be that whilst also stepping into your own potential that is, I think, the gift of purpose. Yeah, actually, it's a really good point. So I might just un- unwrap a little bit my purpose because um, it also, it's it's interesting when you how you frame things and how you choose to um, define your purpose. So when I say being an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, the first part of that is around you know, I want to um, experience as much as I can. And then I go, you know, and and really experience what it is across a number of different industries and modalities and really live it to the full. So the second part is um, living my life out loud. So the third part is showing that anything's possible. So it actually, because I've chosen that, it's a really simple and really beautiful thing for me because it makes me live my best life every single day. So it almost in deciding as part of my purpose to share it with the world and inspire others and show them that anything's possible. It's actually making me get off my ass and be like, yeah, I'm going to try this. I'm going to get out there and challenge myself and get uncomfortable and keep trying different things. So it's, um, so, so I would say to anyone, like, make sure that you wrap your purpose in such a way that it also keeps you accountable to your mission. And so mine is just so simple. And so it's really beautiful because as you step into life and things become bigger and bigger or you taste some success, so many opportunities come every single day. And as an entrepreneur or anyone in life who wants to live big, so, you know, for an example, people might say, hey, I want to go into business with you doing, I don't know, blah. And I'll be like, oh, my my." initial gut reaction is, oh my gosh, so excited because I get excited and passionate about most things. I choose to live consciously in joy. But then I go, does that actually fit within my purpose? Mm. No, it doesn't. So it's like, thank you very much. That sounds extraordinarily exciting, but I'm going to have to say no. And the power of no when you're on purpose is way more important than the power of yes, because otherwise your life becomes busy And, you know, let's not glorify being busy. (laughs) And you actually start losing focus of what it is that you're here to do. And you start, you know, grabbing at all sorts of different things. And before you know it, and I've been there, and this is why I can say it, you're living this life that actually isn't on purpose. And you're actually drowning and you feel like you're, you know, every day not in your genius zone. And so I think it's really important to, you know, stay clear and stay on purpose. Next up, we have the new podcast entry. So, Greg, to give you context on my next question, while we're having a chat about all things purpose, I believe that purpose is something that really does ask us to accept all of who we are, even, you know, even the weird and, and stranger bits of who we are. And, and it's something that asks us to ce- celebrate really what is unique about the gifts we have uh, to offer the world, rather than trying to fit into a mould of what we might traditionally think that success should look like. Now, when you started out in music, I'm guessing the goal was not necessarily to become the star of a, a children's entertainment group. So, in, if you think back to that time, in your opinion, what do you think you needed to let go of with regards to your expectations around your career to go on and invite in the success of something like the Wiggles into your life? Yeah, that's a really interesting question um, because, again, it, it wasn't something that I was really conscious of. Mm. I was so young when I started in the Wiggles. I was 19. Um, so there was a lot of... A lot of growing up that I was still kind of doing at that point in time and a lot of self-discovery that kind of, look, on reflection, probably got put on hold to a certain extent. I kind of got swept up in what the Wiggles was, um, 
without really finding myself at mm. that point in time, if that makes any sense. It's, yeah. And it's something that because being the Wiggles, at the time I left the Wiggles, I was, I think, 34 years old. So I'd been part of the Wiggles for nearly as long as I'd, sorry, for nearly half the time that I'd been alive. Mm. So, And at a time when you really do step into self-discovery in, in your 20s where it sounds like you would have been so busy. Yeah, and, yeah. and kind of living this dual life too of Greg Wiggle versus Greg Page and it, it's no excuse for anything because everybody has this in some way, shape or form. But I think, as I said, it kind of got put on hold for a long time. It was just like, okay, well, I'm Greg Wiggle and there's... I guess a lot of perhaps I felt a bit of expectation about who I should be mm. as Greg Wiggle. Mm. And, look, it's it's been an interesting journey and it's one I'm still on trying, trying to work out some of the answers. But, uh, it, you know, again, I still feel this pull towards living my purpose and it's funny how life turns on a dime sometimes and that purpose can sometimes change or pull you slightly in a different direction. I, I mean... Looking back, I still feel that part of my life purpose is to educate mm. and to educate children through music and entertainment because I believe that's something I'm strongly connected to and I enjoy doing it. So I think with any any purpose, it's got to come from within and it's not the external rewards that you look for because that's when you can go wrong because you, you place your faith in, if I want to talk in, let's say, Christian terms, false gods or false idols, mm. whereas if you look from any any point of, I mean, and this is what I love about spirituality and religion, it's all intertwined. They have different terms that they use to phrase things. Mm. But if you look at anything, it, it's got to come from within. It's got to come from this intrinsic motivation and it's that intuitive, you know, if we use that word, intuitive, instead of looking within, if you just feel that intuitive pull, you'll know where you're being pulled toward. And I think when you try to align that with external success such as money or fame or those kinds of things, that's when you can go wrong because that's the ego kind of talking. And I think it's when you do things from the intrinsic point of view of wanting to, to do good for the world or do, do good to spread good, and that's when you will find success because the success comes from within, not from without. I'm really interested to know what role do you think purpose will play professionally but also in our personal lives beyond this epidemic? What does the future of purpose look like post-COVID-19? I think that we're going to realise that purpose is not a fad. It's not a trend. It's an inherent, intrinsic human need that it's encoded in us to decode. I like that. But it's encoded in us uh, from when we were born, that we're wired to ask this why question. Mm. And just like when we ask that why question of ourselves or others, if you notice when you ask that question, there's a pause for the person because we're forced to explain ourselves and justify what we're doing. Or in this case, when someone asks, why are you? You're justifying your usefulness and your contribution, your existence. And I think it's that space that this uh, pandemic has revealed that we're not necessarily just going to be able to forget about. There's a lot of people out there, people that I've met, that are doing this self-reflection work because this pandemic has forced them to do so. Mm. And I think that what they're going to find there is going to be more sustaining and, and long lived. And I think that we're also going to see in the future that purpose is a skill. It's a skill that people can learn. We can learn to develop a purposeful mindset, just like someone can learn to meditate. Uh, we can learn to show people that they matter, just like we can learn to manage uh, people or a profit and loss sheet. And I think the next step in this whole purpose movement is turning purpose into a sort of mass reskilling of people mm. to be able to uh, approach their lives and their work from a contribution centered standpoint with the new realization that independence as a human being is impossible. 
we're inherently interdependent, and this has shown us that. Because we know so little about what gets an idea from A to B to C to D, at what speed, and then even if we can get it all the way as far as we want to spread it, even if we can get it there, what makes people take action? Mm. Even once they've got it, what makes people take action? And we're still, like, this is, the technology is very new. The capacity for us to do it is still very new. I mean, you look at social change movements um, throughout the ages, and I haven't been able to find, and I have looked pretty hard, and I asked Matthew, he hadn't found any either, studies that show the velocity of, of these social change movements over time. Mm. I know that the, um, the gay rights movement from basically if you go back to when it was illegal and you could be committed to the bill passing for gay marriage, that's, I think Time magazine called that the fastest social change movement of our time when compared to other social change movements. But then we've also, you know, we've had Me Too. We have Black Lives Matter. And so this velocity is getting faster and faster. And I think the more we understand about what ideas take hold, how they take hold, how quickly they can move, the mechanics behind that, and then what happens when someone takes an idea and actually actions it, like how do you get that to happen? Mm. Not only will we be able to do more good work in the world, um, I think we'll also be able to recognise a lot more when, I don't want to say bad, unhelpful work is being done in the world. On the topic of the ultimate empathy machine, I think in the midterm, the greatest application for, for virtual reality is actually to start helping people understand what it's really like to live in somebody else's shoes. Mm. Um, we, we seem, and I'll use a, a, a rather crude example, but in this country, there's a lot of aversion to the idea that we're taking, taking in uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and I don't think enough people truly understand the trauma um, that those people have gone through and the mm. situations that so many of them um, have been unfortunate enough to be entangled in. Um, and so the idea that instead of seeing a nightly news report, um, a 2D image stuck in your screen with commentary from a reporter and a narrative that the station uh, <clears throat> wants to tell or is either told to tell uh, by various influences, including ownership, instead being able to strap on a VR headset and, and see it. And, and feel it and it's almost Be as it. if you're there yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's going to be an incredibly powerful tool which works towards a point in time where VR plays a very very important tool um, in probably not the eradication but dramatic reduction in bigotry and sexism and discrimination we've all had a little bit of time I guess over the last few months to to reflect and ask ask much bigger questions about the kind of world we want to exist in. And one of the things I personally have been reflecting on is how valid the purpose economy is within a capitalist society. And the reason I say that is because, you know, don't get me wrong, I completely believe uh, that every business should have a return on impact. Um, however, you mentioned in one of your speeches that I watched online um, something that really piqued my interest when you mentioned that one of the things, again, that kept you up at night was the inequality of emerging technology in that the wealth goes to the people who can afford it. And when it comes to the idea of the purpose economy, I kind of feel a little bit the same way at this point in time in that you can change the world if you can afford it. Um, and if you just consider like conscious consumerism as an example, it's, it's really expensive. So people who don't have that kind of money or who are living in the slums in India can't afford to buy, you know, Adidas shoes made out of ocean plastic, even though that is amazing. So I absolutely, you know, I, I believe in, in social enterprise, and I think this is key in creating progressive social change, but at the same time, it feels like the solution is bigger than business, um, that it might be time that we needed to possibly rethink an economy uh, that isn't built upon growth and is more focused on, on inclusivity and sustainability or even resilience at this particular point in time. So I'm interested you know, to understand what your thoughts are on that and what kind of economy you would write to create a sort of more a fairer, more equitable and sustainable world? 
Yeah, awesome. There's so much in that. So I know. I, I feel like it's there great. was. <laughs> no, it's Thanks great. For I love with it. Me there. <laughs> I, I love it. There's there's so much meat there. Um, so some of the things that that came up for me during um, what you were saying. Number one is um, the recognition that a lot of our conversations about purpose carry inher inherent privilege in them, mm. um, and that there is a risk of us making assumptions. Um, that apply only to people who look like us or sound like us or come from a similar background to ours. Um, and so uh, I remember uh, way back when Jamie Oliver did a, a series um, on um, chicken, a TV show about chicken. Mm -hmm. And he went and talked to the farmers and he went and talked to the supermarkets and he looked at what, what it looks like to have a, you know, cage chickens versus um, cage free versus free range and all the different kind of categories and, you know, what happens along the process. And, uh, and I loved it so much because he really came at it from a perspective of helping us understand, like, why would the farmers do this in this way if they're doing cage chick battery chickens, right? Why would the supermarkets do this in, in this way? And understanding the pressure from consumers on having chicken, more, less expensive chicken be available. And then the pressure that the supermarkets put on the farmers to be able to do that. And then the pressure that the families uh, are experiencing because they're trying to feed their kids and they don't, you know, they can't afford a, a $12 chicken. They need a $5 chicken, right? And so, um, so he really came at it from such a place of non-judgment. And at the end of the show, he said, here is what I am asking from you. I am asking for you to buy the best quality chicken you can afford, which I thought was so beautiful. You know, he wasn't mm. saying like buy free range chicken or you're doing it wrong, in which case people who are on a single income or on a benefit are going, well, I'm going to be doing it wrong because I cannot afford to feed exactly. my kids. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's beautiful. So, um, so, so recognizing that, in, that inherent privilege that you've, that you've identified is, it's so critical. Um, number two, uh, you talked about the the kind of failures of capitalism here, and a hundred percent, it's they're partly failures of capitalism and partly failures of our understanding of what is the purpose of capitalism. Like, what does it do well, and what does it not do? What should we not look to it for? Mm. So, um, so as I said before, um, I think it is very strange that we have businesses that are not required in some way to talk about their impact on the rest of like to me the, to me this is a fundamental failure of the way we've set up the system that we allow people to operate you know people we allow businesses to operate without without any kind of accounting uh for you know whether they are whether they're doing uh, uh overall uh, having an overall positive impact or not <laughs>